I'd just like to say a big hello and thank you for joining us today. So just a run through um, of the agenda. Um, it's obviously really great to see so many people joining us um, and many who came along to the Acts of Sussex Network back in February um, and specifically the This Girl Can Sussex Network launch session. Um, so those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Gemma Finlay Gray. I'm one of the strategic relationship managers at Active Sussex. Um, I'll be facilitating the session um, today, supported by my colleagues, Harry Smith um, and Nick Shalau, um, and Sadie's also on the call um, and will be supporting um, the group sessions. Um, they'll be keeping an eye on the chat, the chat box, um, so do feedback your questions there. So the agenda, we've got a little bit of an introduction from myself and an overview of um, today's session. Then we've got um, the lovely Jo Fuller, who is the founder of the Merry Menopause, um, and she'll be giving us a bit of an overview of the menopause um, and what it is. Um, and then we'll be followed by Liz Prince from Women in Sport, who I said will be sharing some of the, the latest research that Women in Sport have done um, around midlife and the menopause. We'll then have a, a Q&A um, with Joe and Liz. So if you can um, add any questions that you've got for them in the chat box, uh, Nick and Carrie will be having, having a look through those um, and we'll either relay them or we'll ask you to unmute yourself and um, say them yourself. Um, after that, we've got two of our fantastic This Girl Can Sussex champions, Deb Bullen and Loretta Locke, and they'll be giving us um, a, uh, their real life experience um, of the menopause. We'll then hopefully have a short break uh, where you can stretch your legs and get a coffee um, and then we'll move into the small group discussions. So this is a, a real opportunity for you to kind of reflect on the insight and um, what's been kind of discussed um, and have that opportunity to ask one another questions and um, talk about um, things that are happening in Sussex and maybe collaboration ideas. Um, and then we'll come all back in together and we'll um, have a summary and next steps. Next slide, please, Karen. So why the menopause and physical activity? Well, following the launch of um, the This Girl Can Sussex Network and reviewing the general reflections from what the partners who attended were saying, it was really clear that there was a general need to better understand individual motivations and barriers to why women and girls um, participate or don't participate. And some of the key challenges um, or life changes that may stop a woman or girl from participating. And the menopause was one of these topics raised in many of the groups. Uh, it was also highlighted that to do this effectively and raise awareness and better engage with women, um, we, we really need to look at educating, increasing the knowledge around women and girls, um, and especially that of the sport and physical activity sector workforce. So we committed to deliver this Girl Can Sussex Network theme forum events on these important topics, to share insights, resources and information regarding physical activity for women and girls and hopefully including some practical ideas around engagement as well as providing a platform to share lived experiences from our This Girl Can Sussex champions to really bring the local and national insight to life and hear from real women. As mentioned, uh, we've got a really great lineup today. Um, I'm really pleased to have everyone um, on board. Um, and we really hope that you do go away with some kind of clear, clear outcomes. For us, what we want this session to do is to provide raised awareness of the menopause and the benefits of physical activity and to be confident at then sharing this insight onwards recommendations to support women to maintain and or re-engage with physical activity before, during and after the menopause, and general awareness around the This Girl Can Sussex Network and our champions. And hopefully in time, um, our collective efforts will see more women participating and particularly in response to this um, area of, of work, the 40 to 55 age bracket. 
So without further ado, I would like to welcome Jo to the stage. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have a physical stage soon. Um, <laughs> so hi Jo, it's so great to have you join us here today. Oh, I'm mute. <laughs> Carrie, you can stop sharing your screen as well, thank you. I should, should know that by now. <laughs> Thank you, for, thank you for inviting me. I mean, it's a real, it's a real honour to be um, to be talking on this subject um, and alongside Women in Sport UK, which is an amazing organisation and Active Sussex. So, thank you, thank you very much. Not a problem, not a problem. No, thank you, because I know you're you're a busy lady with uh, going back to work um, at this time <laughs> and uh, all the work you're doing with the Mary Menopause. So would you mind giving us a bit of an intro um, and the backstory of becoming a, a menopause advisor um, and, and why you set up the Mary, Mary Menopause? Yeah, so I, it was, Mary Menopause is two years old. She, I launched on International Women's Day in 2019. And it was as a result of my experience. I had never heard of perimenopause. I thought menopause was something that was going to happen to me in my 50s. And I was ignoring it. You know, it was just, I thought it was hot flushes, dry vaginas. I thought that was it. And I'll deal with that when it comes uh, it was a kind of a bit of a, a joke amongst my friends as we got older, you know, so we're getting, it's getting a bit warm in here, you know, okay, you know, having a hot flush, you know, it was just that, that negative jokey stigma. And then in my early 40s, I started to experience anxiety and it came out of nowhere. I'd never had anxiety um, and my body really started to ache. Um, and cognitively, I noticed some real changes and I was scared. I really wondered what what the hell was going on um and it was by talking to older women especially um, I've always had a regular yoga practice talking to older women at the yoga studio and it's that sort of older woman passing down the information I suddenly learned this new word perimenopause and that actually your menopause you know starts before your periods stop um and I then looked at a lot of my friends and stuff that was happening to them, what was going on in their life. And it was due to this natural and unavoidable hormonal transition that every woman will go through. We can't avoid it. If we live long enough to, to get to our sort of late thirties, early forties, we will start to experience perimenopause. And that's really where the conversation of menopause starts. That's really where we're most symptomatic is that lead up time. Um, and so that's why I started the Mary Menopause. It's like, let's highlight this, talk about it. Let's, you know, a lot of women suffering there, a lot of women, you know, going through postpartum at that time. We're having children later. That's a lot of women, you know, reaching the pinnacle of their career. You know, menopausal women that make up a massive percentage of the workforce. It's not talked about, it's not supported, and women are wrongly diagnosed and wrongly medicated and wrongly treated. Um, so we need to educate ourselves, you know, before before the medical profession in a lot of cases do, we need to go armed with the information and ask for the help we need. Brilliant. So, so thankfully, having advocates like you, and, and there's a lot of talk around the menopause at the moment. I've seen there's a few kind of um, uh, articles in papers, and we've got a few programmes on the TV coming up around it. Um, but having advocates like yourself um, and talking about, about the menopause is hopefully... Um, it's becoming less of a taboo um, but I think so many of us including women including myself I didn't know much about it and um, we still really don't know that much when it starts how long etc could you just run us through kind of the stages so we have so I've mentioned perimenopause so your, your menopause itself the menopause is one day it's the very last day of your last period and for many women, we, we look at that retrospectively because we don't know when, when that's gonna, gonna happen. So I'm currently, I'm 51 and I'm on a hundred, day 107 of my cycle. So, you know, this could be it for me. I, could, I may never have a period again, which I'll be very sad about because I work a lot with menstrual cycle tracking and productivity. Um, and that's one way I will know when my menopause was that one day. And I will have a party because I think <laughs> the 50th. So I will have a menopause party. So we have menopause. That's your one day, that very day of your last period. And then everything beyond that, you're post menopause. So you're living without hormones um, pretty much for a third of your life. The average age of menopause, that last day of your period is 51. Everything up leading up to that is perimenopause. And it kind of starts in your mid-30s. 
you know, during that time, your mid thirties or 35 to 45, you will have good ovarian function. Um, so you will be energized. You will have a sex drive. You won't really notice the symptoms, but slowly, slowly your ovarian function will be starting to dwindle. And that means that you'll be, you're born with all your eggs and your egg supply is dwindling. Um, and towards the end of that phase, sort of mid to early to mid forties, you'll probably start to know some notice some irregularities in your periods, but you will still be having periods, but they might just not be as uh, spot on as they used to be. Um, they may change in length, they may change in the, in your flow might change. And you'll probably start to notice some cognitive changes, which is down to the, the lack of estrogen production. And that's really where a lot of women get unstuck because the three sort of major symptoms of menopause are cognitive. That's anxiety, depression, and low mood. And they go completely undetected and untalked about. And people get put on antidepressants or they ignore it and they think there's something wrong. So it's really about highlighting that really early stage of it. And once you understand it and recognize it, like I did, it's like, okay, this is normal, this is natural, this is happening. I can stop panicking. I can work with it and I can understand it. And I can, you know, I don't, I can be kind to myself. I don't have to keep apologizing. I can explain, you know, this is normal when we start to lose our estrogen. And then from 45, really upwards to around 55, um, we, periods will eventually stop, but the symptoms can get, can increase. Um, and that's when we come into the more sort of common um, sort of poster symptoms of menopause, the hot flushes, the night sweats, the dry vagina, the lack of libido, the low mood. Um, and what I have learned in the two years of doing um, the merry menopause, many of these symptoms can be avoided by lifestyle choices and exercise, obviously a massive part of that diet, exercise and stress management. So you don't have to have uh, a dreadful menopause. I mean, I, I really want to change that PR, remove that stigma and just educate women that yes, you will have a menopause, but actually you can support it and go with it if you know what it is and how to do that. So you can have a merry menopause. Fantastic. So, you know, ideally by, by talking about it, by learning more, um, we can start to understand the effects better and be prepared and supported. Normalize um, it. Yeah, and normalize it. Normalize yeah. It. Definitely. So, so you mentioned a little bit there around the impact on both physical and mental well-being. So, so from your view, you know, how important is it to encourage women to get active or, or just move more um, before, during and after the menopause? Well, I mean, really, the, the lifestyle choices that we make all our life are going to impact our menopausal symptoms, but especially around sort of the mid 30s. That's really when your body starts to change, our metabolism slows down, our hormonal function starts to decrease. So really, from your mid 30s onwards, if you can start to make the changes, you, you know, you're setting yourself up for a merry menopause. Um, exercise is so important um, because our a the, the cognitive side so we call, you know the menopause blues that low mood that obviously is boosted by exercise we all feel good when we've exercised exercise helps to build muscle strength you know we're a skeleton held up by muscle and um estrogen really starts to um remove our um our muscle mass so exercise is so important to keep our muscle strength strength um, to uphold our skeleton so we can stay upright. It's also really important for our pelvic floor and our pelvic girdle. Incontinence is huge. There's so many women, you know, end up losing their independence because of incontinence. So, you know, exercise will help to strengthen your pelvic girdle um, and help with incontinence. It, exercise improves bone density. You know, osteoporosis is very, very common as we get older weight bearing exercise. And that doesn't mean you have to go down the gym, yoga, Pilates, walking are weight bearing exercises, build that bone strength. Um, it helps us to stay flexible. So it keeps our joints moving. So again, we can keep our independence as we get older. And the other really important thing about exercise is it helps with the natural detoxification of our system. So although we have a build up, we're losing our hormones as we get into this transition, we also, once our body's used hormones, it needs to get rid of them. And it does that through its natural detoxification system, through the liver, through sweating, through breathing, um, and through going to the toilet. So 
we have to support that natural detoxification and by exercising we stimulate the liver we stimulate the organs that support the natural detoxification and if we don't get rid especially of estrogen if we don't get rid of it we can end up with um, symptoms of estrogen dominance so we have too much estrogen in relation to our progesterone and as we stop ovulating we stop producing progesterone so it's really about trying to balance that out and that estrogen dominance can lead to cellulite uh, bloating that layer of fat around the middle which is also a big sign that um, you know you could then lead on to cardiovascular um, issues diabetes and also hormone related cancers so getting rid of that layer of estrogen dominant fat around the middle is hugely important and we support that detoxification with our diet, obviously high fiber foods, cutting out hormone imbalancing foods, sugar, caffeine, processed foods. Really, it's, it's a holistic thing. It's not a one size fits all. It's, it's, you need to look at everything and exercise and diet really in the core of that. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think uh, and hopefully for everyone listening, that's given everyone a really good overview um, and, and better insight into what the menopause is. Um, and like you say, that it, it's not just um, what we think of in that, um, you know, 50, 55 age category with you saying the kind of some of those symptoms, you know, it starts earlier in terms of the many, uh, the perimenopause and really starting to understand um, and, and be better prepared um, to, to manage those symptoms uh, and look at it from a holistic point of view. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts so passionately um, and also touching on the benefits of being physically active, which I think follows on really nicely um, to introduce Liz um, from Women in Sport, who will, will share some of the insight. Um, so after, the, after Liz's presentations, we'll then have a QA and a um, with both yourself and Liz. So um, just to the delegates, please do drop in any questions in the chat box um, and we'll be keeping an eye on them. And after Liz is finished, um, we'll do a bit of a QA and a with, with Joe and Liz. So Liz, when you're ready, if you'd like to share your screen, over to you. Great, thank you very much. So that should now be sharing, can you see it? Perfect, thank Brilliant. you. Brilliant, thank you. So my name is Liz Prince and I'm an Insight Manager at Women in Sport. I do have to tell you all, I'm working through a migraine right now. Um, so apologies if I have to go suddenly, but hopefully I'll be okay. And in fact, I've heard that Serena Williams played a number of grand slams with migraines and won them. So she can do that. I'm trying to channel her for this presentation. So hopefully it will be okay. Um, and if you haven't heard of Women in Sport, we're a charity that was founded in 1984. Um, and we do research exclusively from the position or perspective of women and girls to understand their sort of motivations and barriers around exercise, sport, and physical activity. When it comes to menopause, we've done um, two pieces of research now. An original piece of research in 2018 that was pretty narrowly focused on menopause, uh, and one that, as Jim just mentioned, um, we've just finished and we'll be launching next week, that's much more around what's going on in, in midlife in menopause because we wanted to understand the bigger picture. Um, and you should have all got that invitation um, to the launch on the 19th of May from Jem's email. Um, so if you're interested, please do sign up. It won't just be me having this presentation. It's also going to be a great panel of women um, and a really exciting um, release of a bunch of brilliant photos that we've done in partnership with Getty Images of women in midlife being active, including Carol Bates and her Crawley Old Girls Club. And I think Carol's on the call today. So we'll really look forward to launching that. Before I go straight into talking about um, our latest research, though, I do just want to sort of talk to you about women in sports general approach. So we tend to look at women's and girls' different life stages individually to understand um, what women, the sort of motivations and barriers that women are facing in each of those life stages, because we know um, that they will be different. You know, what girls are going through it, the teenage years are really different from what's happening when you're having a child um, or when you're going through menopause or indeed in later life. And so we consider each of these life stages separately, but then we can also look at how they all build on each other um, and how they interrelate so that by menopause, for instance, in midlife, um, you are 
sort of looking at all of these past experiences with activity that might be good, they might be bad, and that's very much defining how women are feeling in menopause and midlife. So why focus on midlife? We have a couple of different reasons for that. And I think Joe has given a brilliant presentation that explains pretty clearly why this is such an important life stage. But just to add to what she's already said, um, number one, in our first piece of research in 2018, we found that this really was a time of reappraisal for women, um, that they were going through a lot of changes in their bodies um, and just thinking about what mattered to them and their values. And so this was really a key time when if they weren't active already, you could sort of get in with activity and, and help them to consider that as they considered what they wanted to do with themselves and, you know, going forward. It's also really important to note that women feel overlooked. And I think as Jim mentioned, you know, we've seen a lot of articles, even in the last week, um, and there's a great um show coming out with Davina McCall at 9 p.m. on Wednesday, actually, about menopause as well. So there's lots happening suddenly about menopause, but for a long time, that just hasn't been the case. Um, and I think women in this age group feel like they've just been overlooked generally by society, or, you know, those negative jokes that Joe was talking about are being made. But also in the sports sector, there's just not that much provision for women in this, this age group. So we need to be thinking about that as a sector. And in fact, um, in terms of statistics, actually 33% of women in the UK are not meeting the chief medical officer's guidelines uh, at midlife for uh, um, of 150 minutes of exercise a week. So when I say midlife, I'm looking at women aged 41 to 60, frankly, because that's the Sport England Active Lives age division that I could find. But that's a third of women not meeting those requirements. Um, and lastly, um, Joe really hinted at this as well. This really is an important time to set up habits that will actually keep women healthier longer and later into sort of old age. Um, because if we can help women get active now before the physicality really starts to decrease, then actually those habits will be embedded so that they will be active into later life. I won't talk too much about the methodology of our research, but just a few points I wanted to make. Number one is that this research was um, with women in lower socioeconomic groups specifically because we knew that these women have additional barriers and that they're much less likely to be active. So actually women in lower socioeconomic groups are 20% less likely to be active um, and meeting those CMO guidelines than women in higher socioeconomic groups. When we did this research, we did a very iterative methodology that sort of allowed us to really dig deep and get to know the women and understand what was going on in their lives. And in fact, we ended the research with an activity exploration, which was a four week exercise trial with eight women, um, where the first two weeks they thought about what activity they wanted to do, they researched it with the researchers, and then in the third week they did it, and in the fourth week they did it again. Um, and so it was something that they chose, but we could follow them through that journey and really understand their sort of emotions around exercise as well as the practical barriers. So what did we find? Well, from the research, we've developed a model um, of menopause, midlife and exercise. And you can see the first half of that model on the screen right now. I'll just highlight a couple of things. Um, I'll start with the midlife factors on the left-hand side. So women told us about health concerns um, decreasing physicality was just beginning to start for women. I mean, we did speak to women from the age of sort of 40 to, I think the oldest was 57. So we did speak to quite a wide range. So um, those in their younger 40s maybe weren't quite seeing this decreasing physicality yet, but those in maybe their 50s and later 50s were starting to see that. And you see from this woman here, she said, I'm battling between living a healthy, active lifestyle and my health condi conditions that make restrictions in, on what I can do. And I think for her, this was arthritis. So she was starting to have some things thrown up by aging that meant that she was struggling to be active. Prioritizing others is a really big thing as well. We found over and over again that women felt like they had to prioritize everyone else over themselves. And this was kids, this was aging relatives, this was partners, um, you know, people at work, neighbors, just you name it, everyone came before them. And this quote's pretty stark. It says, you know, my needs come after my family's needs. So everyone comes before 
the woman herself. And that's tied a lot to these caring responsibilities. So um, it, women are dealing, as I said, with a lot of different caring responsibilities. And you see here, this woman has said, at the moment, my time's not very flexible being tied up with my parents. I've been living there for eight weeks now after dad came out of hospital. So not only is there caring, but it can be really disruptive. You know, imagine moving in with someone to care for them for eight, 10, 12 weeks. Um, so that, just thinking about how women have to um, spend their time sometimes is, is really important as well. And then the last thing is around connection and belonging. Um, and this woman here says, I didn't want to expose myself, you know, have all these different feelings and emotions. That's too much on the plate for me to sort of tell anybody. And this is, this is a clear lack of sense of connection and belonging. And you can see how much this woman is suffering from this quote. I mean, the sense that you can't sort of burden anyone else with what you're going through is really um, powerful and really problematic um, for women. So then I do wanna talk about the menopause side. So on the right-hand side of the model as well, one of the major things we heard from all of the women in our study was the poor sleep was a huge problem. And whether this was um, waking up in the middle of the night, not being able to get to sleep, having night sweats, you know, whatever it was, it, it, all of them had poor sleep. And so um, this quote here sums it up quite nicely, I think. Another night of very uncomfortable rest. One minute, I feel like I'm on fire. I get up, put the fan on. Next thing I'm cold, I get up, switch off the fan. So I really didn't rest. So that constant cycle. Um, and then what it leads to is the cycle of short-term fixes. So this woman, I love this quote. I grab a packet of chocolate, my reward for lack of sleep and my zombie headache. So, you know, the cycle is that not only are they tired, but they're also having pains like headaches. Um, and then they go to short-term fixes like sugar, like alcohol, like takeaways, um, you know, whatever they can find to just help them get through the day sort of psychologically, emotionally, and physically. Um, and that can then lead to weight gain, although weight gain also happens for other reasons, um, including the sort of hormonal things that are going on that Joe talked about. And a lot of women found that, well, all of the women, again, this was the second most common thing that they told us was how much they hated the weight gain. And as you can see from this quote here, you know, I'm not really eating more. Every year since the age of 42, I've put on a pound or two. They felt like they weren't changing their habits, but suddenly their body was changing and they were finding that they had these extra pounds on them. Um, and especially around their bellies, which they really hated. So that was a really... To the women themselves, that was a really big problem. They really hated that this was happening to them. Um, and then fluctuating hormones as well as lack of sleep led to really um, difficult mood swings. So this woman says, I can't seem to hold my anger in. I'm horrible and I don't know how my family put up with me. I want to feel normal again. So this wasn't just about sort of the mood swings themselves, but some women described just feeling like completely different people and mourning the loss of that easygoing, calm person that they used to be. So it really bothered them that this was happening to them and also made them worry about their relationships. As you can see from this quote, they were worried about how their family sort of was, was coping with their own issues. And then there's still this real sense that menopause is a taboo and it's really isolating. So this woman said, you know, there's no one to talk to an offload with, you just take it for granted that this is the time when you have a change of life. Nobody talks about it, to be honest. So that's going back to what Joe said about, you know, not knowing about um, even perimenopause. And I've heard that from so many women um, that they haven't even heard the word perimenopause before. And suddenly it's happening to them in their forties. Um, and they just, they don't under, they don't know what's going on. They're scared, like Joe said, but also they're sort of, they don't know what's normal. And so they don't, if they're not talking about it with anyone, then they don't get that sense of actually this is really normal and it's okay and you're not the only one, which is so important. So then the second half of the model, which will all be on one page in the report, but I've divided it out for this presentation, is all about how those things then lead to barriers to activity. And we've used the Calm B model here to um, explain the barriers. And that's just um, a model of behavior change that looks at capability, opportunity, and motivation. So I'll run through a couple of each of these as well. With capability, one of the things we found is that women had a really limited view of what exercise could be. 
So women told us it was um, swimming, gym, walking, running, and they didn't want to do running. So really it was swimming, gym, walking. And those were the only things that they thought were out there for them. Um, and because, and a lot of them really didn't like the gym. As you can see here, OMG, there was nothing more boring than the gym. You know, if you already have that limited experience and understanding of what you can do, then if you don't like the gym, that's quite a lot of things already off your list if your list is only three things. Um, women also told us that, you know, from a young age, a lot of them just didn't think of themselves as sporty. So they had experiences going all the way back to their childhood of negative experiences of sport. So this woman says, I have so many negative images of exercise in my past that I'm not looking forward to it very much. It's just so scary. So that's a lot of baggage to carry, first of all, to um, sort of bring to exercise and physical activity if you're inactive. But it also became this sort of defining characteristic of themselves. They saw themselves as not exercisers. And so that's really a powerful identity that you have to help women overcome, really. And then the last thing is, is lack of energy. So this woman said, what holds me back is how I'm feeling day after day, tired, sluggish, and unmotivated. Getting even more hot and sweaty just doesn't appeal. So this, you know, if you're not sleeping well, I think even in the best of circumstances, exercise is going to be a bit of a, a push. But if you add in the fact that you don't like exercise, then it's just going to be that much harder, quite frankly. In terms of opportunity, going back to the weight, I mean, I feel like we just can't stress this enough. The women really felt embarrassed and ashamed about the extra weight they put on. And that came to the fore when it came to thinking about being in exercise spaces. Um, so this woman says, I'm overweight and go red very easily. I would feel as if they're looking at me and I'd feel embarrassed. So there's this real shame and worry about being embarrassed. Um, another is the sense that exercise spaces are just not for these women. Um, so this woman said, I know I need to get healthy, but I'm large and classes are full of nine stone skinny lycra wearing people. We heard this again and again, um, this sense that um, gyms especially were for thin young people, not, and then just didn't see women like themselves in those spaces. Um, and then the last ties into all of this, which is the fear of ridicule. And this quote I think is, is really um, heartbreaking. You know, will I be laughed at? Will I be ridiculed? Am I too old? Am I unfit? Will I fit in? Um, all of these things that are going through this woman's mind before she even steps foot in an exercise space. And then last is the motivation. Um, so, women just, especially inactive women, just really didn't think that they'd enjoy exercise. They didn't have that experience of enjoying it in their past. And so they really, they told us, you know, this is not something I'm going to enjoy. So this woman said, I've conditioned myself to think of exercise as painful, humiliating, and not fun. Again, we saw that others' needs came first. Um, and this was especially true when it came to making time um, for exercise. So this woman said, when you're younger, before you have children, you can spend your time how you like. As I've grown older, I've had less time to spend as I choose. And I think that that's true, um, very true, given all of the pressures we've talked about um, that women are going through during midlife. And the last thing that women told us is that they didn't want to go alone. Um, if they were trying something new, they really wanted to go with a friend. They didn't want to have to brave it by themselves. So this woman said, who would I go with? I wouldn't go on my own. Um, and so there's this sense that friends and people you know going with you really gives you this confidence boost. I'm gonna speed up a little bit um, because I think I've been a bit slow to this point. Um, so I just wanna talk about the five principles that, that we then developed um, to apply this insight. So we looked at that model and thought, what do women really need from the sports sector? And we came up with five principles. So the first is endless possibilities. Um, and this is partly expanding that perception of um, what physical activity can be. So moving beyond the swimming, walking, running gym um, to show women just all of the wonderful and incredible things that are out there. I've just um, copied here something from our parks that went, is a um, sort of charity that provides activity and went virtual during the pandemic um, and some of their couch two programs. And just to show how diverse these programs can be, you know, couch to aerobics, couch to Bangra, how brilliant do those sound? And it's not, um, something boring that women have tried before. So I think that's brilliant. We need to be doing more of that. Um, we also need to show women in this age what they can achieve. We can, need to tell them that it's not too late for them and they 
can tap into these endless possibilities. Um, we need to make sure that they feel physically capable of doing that um, because they definitely are. Um, and then we need to make sure they can find these activities. This is a big thing is that we found with our exercise trial at the end of our research that actually that women didn't, it, once they looked for things, they found brilliant things, including indeed our parks um, that they hadn't known about before. So we need to make it really easy for women to be able to find these activities. The second is about judgment-free zones. So having a welcoming and supportive environment because Ultimately, exercise should be fun, and we want it to be fun so that women come back again and again. And part of this is to make this a non-judgmental atmosphere. Um, I think, you know, it came across so clearly that women were really scared of being ridiculed, um, made fun of, embarrassed in the exercise space. And while those of us who are active know that that probably won't happen, the women who were inactive didn't know that. They didn't know what to expect and they needed to be reassured. So that despite their skill level, their physique, their age, you know, none of that matters. They need to be reassured that um, it will be a fun and enjoyable experience when they show up. And I think what's really important is that this ethos not just be part of activity because I think in many activities it already is, but that it's in the marketing because ultimately the first thing a woman is going to see about your activity is the marketing. So if you don't communicate that welcoming, non-judgmental ethos, then you might have already lost someone who's afraid of being judged. And I've just included very quickly here the England Rugby Inner Warrior, a snip from their website, which is from their FAQs. Because what I loved about their FAQs is that they stripped it right back down to basics and assumed women who were signing up knew nothing about rugby because that's who the program's targeted at. So they said things like, you know, just wear running kit um, so that you knew exactly what to wear. And then this snip talks about, you know, do I need to know the rules of rugby? Absolutely not. You don't need to know the rules. So it's just the way it was communicated it made someone like me who actually doesn't play team sport interested in actually signing up because I felt like it could be a safe space. The third is around support networks. So this is all about building social support. Um, we talk, you know, I talked about how bringing a friend could actually build confidence to try something new. Um, and so it's really important to have that sense of community within activities as well. And it also creates a sense of belonging, a sense that, you know, I belong here and this is a space for me, which will encourage women to come back again and again. Um, and I've included her spirit here because they have a brilliant sort of virtual and in-person community that they've built and especially for women in this um, age group they've done a brilliant job of making women feel like they have that that sense of belonging um, so they're a really good model of that fourth is expanding the image of what sporty means so this is all about having real and relatable role models so women who are the right age different physiques not all you know stick thin fitness instructors um, who are and who are going through the same things that women in midlife are going through. So talking about the journeys that real women face, telling the story of a woman who's found an activity that they love despite you know, caring for elderly parents, having kids at home, maybe being at the peak of their career, you know, tell real stories of real women and this will help show um, women who might not be active right now that there are places and ways for them to be active. And I've just included the This Girl Can campaign. Um, they've done a brilliant job for women of all ages, showing women of different physiques and ages and situations um, being active. And this Yvonne in particular here is, is someone going through menopause. So it's really, it's brilliant the way that they have sort of normalized that. And the last is making it relevant. So I think quite often when we talk about exercise, we say that it can, you know, it's really healthy for us in the same way we talk about sort of eating your vegetables being really healthy for us. But we need to talk about more tangible benefits that women can experience, things that can be felt immediately, like feeling calm after exercising, you know, increased well sense of well-being, um, in, improved focus. Um, and we can also talk about the specific things that are relevant to women in this age group. And I think Joe listed quite a few of those very helpfully, but just to add to those, you know, women told us sleep was a problem. Well, exercise can help with sleep. It can help with low mood. Um, it can also sort of boost self-esteem. You know, women told us in the exercise trial that once they'd done something good for themselves, they felt better about themselves as well. And of course, meeting new friends and making um, new sort of social contacts is also another benefit. 
And I just included this snip here from Menno Health, which is a great organization that provides fitness classes for women going through menopause and thinks about the women holistically. So there's a sort of 15 minute chat during every session where women can talk about what they're going through, um, compare notes, sort of get expert information. And then the exercise itself also thinks about those weight bearing exercises that are good for bones as well as cardio. So really caters to the needs of women in this life stage. So that is it from me. Um, just to say that I think if we think about these principles and really apply them, we can really inspire women in midlife to get active and give them more and better opportunities that they deserve. So that's it. I just want to say thanks to the People's Postcode Lottery for funding the research. Thanks so much, Liz. That was a great presentation. And uh, thank you once again for being able to share some of that ahead of, ahead of the launch. Uh, hopefully many people have, have signed up um, for that because um, it looks like a great panel um, and some really good conversation that will come out of that again. So thanks for yeah, that overview and the recommendation for the sector and hopefully some really key kind of tangible things that we can take away and think about um, and, and what we can do. Um, and like I said, I, I look forward to seeing the full report, but I'd really like to welcome questions from any of the delegates for both Joe and Liz. Um, so Carrie and Nick, if you're there, um, if you could relay any questions or if anyone would look to, put, to raise their hand um, and ask a question directly, that would be great. Um, I know Anita had a question. Anita, did you want to unmute yourself and, and ask your question at all? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, which... I, I think I put might have put a fair few questions in there. Um, I think the, the latest question that I put was about um, if you're used to, well, sorry, I'll start again. Um, there doesn't appear to be, I haven't particularly looked, but I, from what you were saying, um, research among people who are used to playing at a quite a high level already or being very active already, but being affected by menopause or other you know family commitments and all those other barriers and there seems to be an awful lot of research on getting the inactive active but we also need to think of ke keeping the active active as well and I'm not sure how you feel about that. Shall I start with that? Yeah, I, I, so, so I saw your comment and I, I wanted to comment on that. I should have said at the very beginning, this research was specifically with inactive women. Um, but I think, I think you're absolutely right that as women get older, um, they are, you know, they're, they might not enjoy the activity if they can't, that they've been doing if they can't play it to the same level. So it might be about finding something new, um, which is where those endless possibilities come in. You know, if you try a new activity that's just completely different, maybe you feel a little bit better about it because you're not comparing it to the way you performed when you were younger. Um, I think as well, though, making it relevant, you know, really working with women um, to think about how uh, to not to not kick women off a team, for instance, just because they're over a certain age. I think that's hugely important. Um, I, my, um, my, a colleague of mine actually is on a netball team, um, and every, you know, she's, she's the oldest member on the team and she's going through menopause and she still loves it. So, you know, I think making sure that we aren't thinking about, um, kicking women out at a certain age is hugely important. And, um, so I think you can think about how those principles apply to women who are already really active. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think you're right that more research needs to be done. I mean, ultimately aging happens so you can't sort of keep that from happening but just making sure that you do have that welcoming environment and that you're not being ageist as well um, when someone has been playing something their whole life is, is really important. I, I think as well um, what Joe was saying about how you know your hormones affect you and and being able to recognize that um, is also important <laughs> Um, and, and yeah, I mean, aging is a fact of life. We can't, you know, it just is, but, you know, for example, for myself, um, you know, in my sport, we play right up until, you know, into seventies, if we're, if we're physically able to, um, but I'm, I'm not ready, for example, to play walking 
netball or walking so because I want a bit more than that and there, there somehow needs to be a somewhere in between um, that getting the, the very inactive active and the ones that already are active <laughs> helping them to do a bit more <laughs> yeah absolutely can I can I just add something to that I think um, Anita sort of lovely segue I think I'm very active and I've always been very active um, and I have osteoarthritis in my right knee so I can't run and I've really had to to accept that and I think they're one of the big there are many lessons that menopause teaches us on a, a physical and a mental level it's a really big powerful time of transition and I think one of those lessons is acceptance it's an acceptance that we are aging we're not you know 30 anymore we are in our 50s I read a lovely passage that said you know we're no longer princesses but we're becoming queens and we need to step into that and one of that one of those lessons that we have to learn is acceptance of the change and not fight it embrace it and and go with it and don't beat ourselves up because we can't still do a you know 10 month you know 10k run every weekend it's like my body's saying to me this isn't for you anymore. Move into something that's more, more you. It's about being adaptable and acceptance. And there's no shame in that. Brilliant. Thanks for those answers, guys. I think, Shani, you've got your hand up. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, firstly, um, you know, this is great. This is happening. Um, and everyone's here. And it is about, you know, talking about it and sharing. And interestingly, I put a, face, a, a Facebook post on a, about a month ago, my personal Facebook, about the menopause. And um, I honestly, there was probably about 100 comments from people, friends, friends, friends. And it was really, really useful. And it, it felt like there was a door opening. And I know it's being talked about more. But there was a lot. There has been a lot of shame attached to it. Um, I'm 52, so I've, I'm in my... I think I'm I think I'm in my menopause I haven't counted my days yet but um but um uh, yeah so I just wanted to say thanks for that I, I, and the and the importance of just being able to speak about it and talk about it and even you know talk about periods have men in the room you know we, I did we had the men, menopause demystified training through the council and that I attended that a couple of years ago um, and different people take, take different things from that um, but with regards to promotion and how we promote our activities, I work in the Active for Life team, in the Healthy Lifestyles team, sorry, in Active for Life. And, um, you know, it'd be good to, you know, that the images, the people like us images, you know, a lot of images are of people that are, you know, sporty and fit. Um, and it does put people off. And, you know, so, so that was one question, you know, stock images that we can share as a networks. Um, because a lot of people don't like their picture taken and used if they aren't looking like they feel like they should be. So we have got a lack of that. And um, just just my other thing I was going to say before I be quiet, um, just Anita's comment about sports available for women of, you know, of our age, of a certain age where you're, because I, you know, if you're working with behaviour change and people wanting people to get active that aren't active, it's very daunting to just start an activity. I play beach volleyball I've, uh, um, and I've played for a long time and I'm not, as, you know, I, I hang in there because I'm used to it, you know, and I've been there and I'm, it's, you know, I'm used to the venue. And, but if I was starting new, it would be daunting. So it'd be really good to just look at those activities, you know, that we can share with people that are great activities to, to start age 50. That are safe activities to start at age 50. So there, there were just my comments there. Um, and it's just really great to be here. Thanks for that, Shani. That's really good. I think there's another question from Jimmy. Did Jimmy want to ask his question? Hi. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, kind of... Uh, I don't know. I was kind of wondering about, well, I've chucked a few things in there now, so I don't know which one you're talking about. Sorry about that. I'm a bit, a bit confused. Um, well, uh, first of all, I, I think like, um, you know, my, my, my girlfriend of, of like 15 years, she's kind of feels very peri perimenopausal at the moment and is having trouble sleeping and, and a bit down about things and all that kind of stuff. And so I can't help think, but think about her and like, um, um, she doesn't like uh, physical like, physical activity. It's not something that she's ever really been into, uh, and I really am. And 
and we do a little bit together and stuff. But it's like, I almost think for some women, it's not about, you know, continuing to be physically active as you get older. It's about actually starting for the first time to sort of seriously have a routine of physical activity. And that's a big step. Because like Shani says, you know, I started running years ago. It took me years before I actually felt like, oh, I, you know what, I'm a runner. You know what I mean? You feel like an imposter for such a long time. And, and I wonder how you get um, people into physical activity at a later stage in life when it's not something that they've naturally sort of picked up. Uh, and so I guess the question I put in there was about, you know, because the social and emotional support is such a big part of it and such a draw, is that perhaps where you start and then, in, you know, have social and emotional support that offers physical activity rather than offering physical activities that offer the social and emotional support? I don't know if that is a question. It's just a mess of thoughts and, uh, and what have you. But yeah, very interesting session. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So I thought, wait, uh, just on, on that on that note to Jimmy, I just, I think one thing that I sort of, um, I raise to people that I work with and in my Facebook group, is like, how do you want to feel when you're 70? You know, how do you want to feel when you're 60? How do you want to feel when you're 80? And, you know, we start, if we can start that question at a much earlier age, how do you want to feel when you're 50? It really does come down to looking at your lifestyle choices because they play a huge impact on how you're going to age. And many of the illnesses that, you know, that get us in old age, autoimmune disease and things like that are brought on by lifestyle. And I think it's a really important question, really important subject that maybe you could raise with your girlfriend. It's like, how do you want the next 20, 30 years to look? Because you need to start moving, you need to start making some really good lifestyle choices, and and give her give her the power, you know, because it's up to her. We can, can do as many she can attend as many things like this as she want and be given all the information, but she actually needs to really start feeling it for herself and reframe it and change her mindset and go, yes, I want to feel good as I age, and she needs to start taking action. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, I mean. Funnily enough, we did actually start doing some exercise together. Uh, we started going sort of uh, bouldering on, on a Saturday morning and taking, having breakfast afterwards. And stuff. But then she got a frozen shoulder. So, that's been, oh, okay. so it's about it's the trend line thing. Guy bosh on that. But uh, yeah, yeah. Walking, walking, you know, 10,000 steps a day. Uh, is, yeah. You know, like a baseline yeah. exercise. And you, you don't have to do that in one chunk. That's, you know... If she wears a pedometer, she's got an iPhone, that counts your steps. You know, you build that into your routine every day and some stretching, you know, some Pilates or yoga, 10, 15 oh, yeah. minutes. Mm. You know, she's on the way. She's on the way to having an active, healthy, older life. Well, I, I can't wait to tell her about this uh, this uh, webinar. Actually. Thank you, Jimmy. Well, thank you for and thank you for attending. Um, it's great to have male allies on the on the call and and spreading, spreading the menopause love. Um, so thank you so much for those questions. I think there might be a couple of others that have just come in. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to answer them now. Um, however, I would encourage you to maybe bring them up in your small group discussions. Um, there might be an opportunity to discuss between yourself. We'll also take down the, the, the questions from the chat box and share them with Joe and Liz. Um, and hopefully we can feed back um, after the event as well. So again, thank you so much, Joe and Liz. Really, really insightful um, kind of into the menopause and stages and what we can start to do. I'm now really grateful um, to have two of our This Girl Can Sussex champions, um, Deb Bullen and Loretta Locke, who have offered to share their personal thoughts and experiences. Um, so Deb, if you're there, can I ask you to unmute and feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thanks, Gemma. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, as Gemma said, my name's Deb. Um, I'm an occupational therapist and I work for a company called Sport for Confidence. Um, so just want to say thank you for inviting me to speak about this. It's probably the first time I've spoken <laughs> publicly about <clears throat> my experience. So bear with me if I wobble a bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my experience of being perimenopausal, I, it, I started perimenopause very early um and one of the things that really affected me was exhaustion and I that kind of came in two parts it was insomnia and fatigue um and I've already, always kind of suffered a little bit with insomnia but it was much worse in my 40s and I used to wake up in the middle of the night with a burning hot chest or that's what it felt like um 
And it was then that I kind of realized there must be perimenopausal. Um, I'd feel really hot inside my body and then I'd take off the duvet and then I'd be freezing cold. So it was just this cycle of not sleeping very well. Um, and then on top of that, I then found um, that I was had fatigue and I found that really difficult to deal with, especially because I'm a very active person. Um, and at the time of experiencing this, I was actually changing my career to become an occupational therapist and studying a master's degree and writing a dissertation. Um, and I'd, I remember sitting down and taking breaks from my studies, I'd sit on the sofa with a, with a cup of tea and I'd literally just fall asleep. It would completely take me by surprise. I you know, wasn't feeling tired at the time because I was probably absorbed in my studies. Um, so it was a really different feeling from what I normally had from insomnia. Um, it would just take me completely by surprise and without warning. So I found myself needing lots of afternoon naps, which I found really annoying because I hate wasting time. And to me, like having a nap was a waste of time because I wasn't doing some, something active. So it was a real sort of struggle to get my head around that. Um, and the other thing, I found it really difficult to motivate myself to play sport, which was really hard for me because, as I said, I'm very active. Um, so my way of managing this would be to sort of sign up in advance to like volleyball sessions. So my main sport is beach volleyball, along with Shani. Um, so I'd sign up, sign up in advance for volleyball sessions or I'd organise games with friends. So I was accountable to people. Um, and that would make kind of force me in a way to to get out of the house and play sport. Um, and yeah, as soon as I got to the club and saw my friends and started playing, it, I felt really re-energized. So the social side of joining a beach volleyball club had a huge impact on my life. Um, I found a sense of belonging, like we, they were talking about in the survey earlier. It really boosted my confidence and improved my body image. It just just had a really good impact on me. Um, and I made loads of like-minded friends, um, lots of women my age, but people, you know, from all different walks of life, was able to talk about the menopause with them. And the social side of joining the club really kept me motivated. So it sort of kept me, you know, playing really and keeping active. Um, and one of the things during lockdown when the beach volleyball club was closed, I found like probably the most of Brighton and Hove, I bought a wetsuit and started sea swimming. <laughs> Although I don't, ho I don't own a dry robe, I'm very proud of that. <laughs> um, so sea swimming for me, it's just gave me a real sense of freedom and the cold water just made me feel amazing. And I feel like it helped regulate my body temperature as well but that could have been a bit of placebo. I was kind of hoping that it would help with the menopause. Um, so yeah, my friends, um, the friend that I swim with, we kind of encourage loads of our other volleyball friends to take up swimming as well. And we all go regularly together. And as a result of that, um, personally, I've always liked to set myself challenges, but myself and my friends have now signed up to a triathlon sprint and we're looking at swim trek holidays. So it's, Again, you know, that making friends, making connections leads on to other activities, which has been amazing. Um, and then the other thing to do with the being in my 40s and midlife that um, I found difficult is that whole carving out time for myself to, to play sport. Um, at age 46, I started changing my career, but although I was single and I had no children to look after, I had elderly parents who I was really close to. Um, and at the time of doing my master's degree, my mum had Alzheimer's and I was helping my dad to, and my sisters to care for her. And as a result of all these kind of things going on, I found it really difficult to keep up my sporting activities, especially the beach volleyball, where that was my place really to relax and de-stress. Um, so if I sort of played volleyball, I'd either be feeling guilty that I wasn't studying feeling guilty that I wasn't visiting my parents, feeling guilty that I wasn't helping to care for my mum. And, you know, it was a real, a real struggle. And I think because I come from a family of real stiff upper lip types, and we just get on with things and we don't complain. I think that all took its toll on me in the end. Um, I hadn't really been told by my parents, by my mum or my sisters about the menopause or that I might start it early in my forties. So in the end, I sort of went to see the doctor and I had to see a student counsellor because I was feeling so overwhelmed by all these different things. Um, 
and I felt really stressed and I was probably a little bit depressed at the time but I just I just didn't know I just you know it was only until I went to speak to the doctor that he said oh you know you're probably perimenopausal and then it was like ah oh, the light bulb kind of went off um but yeah lastly I just want to say that as in my role uh, as an occupational therapist at Sport for Confidence I talk a lot um about occupational balance with my clients and about finding time to participate in activities that are important to them and that they enjoy. So I try to encourage them to find ways to fit physical activity into their kind of current daily life, you know, even if they've got a really busy schedule, just simple things, whether it be listening to music and dancing around the kitchen while they're cooking or while they're hoovering or getting up a little bit earlier and doing a bit of yoga before the day starts. We sort of just try to find ways to fit it in rather than, having to make, you know, carve out time if they haven't got that time. It's just sort of, so it kind of goes along side by side. Um, yeah, exercise doesn't have to be a chore, really. It can be part of your everyday life. Um, just need to find a little bit of, little bit of time to sort of squeeze it in. So that's my experience. <laughs> Thank you, Deb. Thank you for sharing. Um, really, really appreciate it. Um, so Loretta, Hello. Yes, hello. Hello. How are you? The floor oh, is yours. <laughs> excellent. Thank you. Okay, so I am one of your traditionally non-sporty women. So um, me and sport have never been very good friends, although I, I love what sport does for people and I'm, I'm a really big advocate of sport. I just, you know, prefer to go out and eat chips and things instead. So it's it's never been something I've particularly taken part in myself. So it's a bit of an odd one for me because I started becoming, I think, perimenopausal last year um, and being very quickly introduced to the wonders of night sweats and uh, hot flushes and all these wonderful things, brain fog and, and lovely stuff like that. And it was actually at that point that I decided that exercise really should be something I integrate into my life, having told everybody else about the benefits for a very long time and, and being a coach myself and that I really should be, you know, a little bit more active. So um, I did the coach to couch to 5k program last year um, and actually from complete fear and dread of starting and being concerned of, you know, running in front of other people and all those kind of things that we worry about generally. But I think particularly with menopause and aging, we um, get a little bit more self-conscious because we're aware that there's all these wonderfully lycra clad, fit, beautiful young women bobbing along the seafront and, and there's me, this big old beach whale that I think the activists are going to come back and throw in the sea at any moment to try and, you know, help me out. So it, it's getting over all that kind of stuff. And, you know, quite often, I think, as women, we can have these concerns anyway and we can look at it in a logical moment and actually say, you know, it's all fine. We're all, we're all people and everybody looks slightly different and it's not really an issue but it's those moments of doubt that really um, concern us and make us doubt that we can do anything. So to get out there and actually do it is a big step. So I can certainly relate to lots of people who struggle with that. Now, um, I, I completed the Couch to 5K last year. I didn't actually complete 5K, but I completed half an hour of running, which to me was like, you know, winning the, the Paralympics or something. So that was fantastic. Um, and I've actually now fallen in love with running, which makes most people who know me sort of laugh quite a lot because usually that wouldn't be something that comes out of my mouth. So um, I have seen the benefits and I am now enjoying that feeling of exercise. And I think um, particularly at the moment, something that I advocate really strongly now is how it helps your mental health and how giving me that headspace and that me time has really helped. So certainly from a personal point of view, I've been feeling the difference of exercise at menopause and coming at it from this slightly different viewpoint of actually starting to exercise at menopause is, is an interesting one. And there were many reasons why I didn't exercise when I was younger. At the time, I've got four children. Um, one of them is disabled. So I'm pretty much full time mum in my younger days. Um, very self-conscious about things like weight and appearance. So would never have exercised in the company of others. Time, money all those kind of constraints so you know the similar stuff you hear so it's quite easy for I think most of us to relate to something that other people feel and actually then be able to maybe give them a little bit of advice on that um 
I believe I'm now entering the menopause. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know the, the medical reasoning about this, but certainly my partner will tell you that um, it's very warm at night time. So he's not too keen on that bit. So I think he's noticed the changes there. I think um, lots of the fears that we face can be sort of logically reasoned with. I think, um, you know, a lot of the things we hear, certainly that I hear in my sort of professional role in, in coaching is that... Um, people can't do it or they can't do what they used to do and they're, they're worried about this um, and I think it's just about giving them the confidence to say just give it a try adapt what you used to do previously try some different sports I think a lot of this has all come up in the chat so we're all very much on the same wavelength here with these kind of ideas but absolutely if you've been playing one sport all your life and you're used to playing it at a certain level that might be quite frustrating so try something different do something entirely new and then you're not comparing against what younger fitter you used to do um another really common one is is how you look so obviously as i've experienced myself as an older person you start thinking you don't look quite right you can't go to the gym because it's full of young people you can't go out running because everyone's faster than you actually it doesn't matter and nobody's watching you so this is this is the most interesting thing i think is to uh take an observation on this and actually get people to stand there and watch joggers running by people exercising in the park how many people are actually watching and judging them it just doesn't happen so you know there's really nothing to worry about and I think another thing that people can get concerned about is they're they're not in the right place to exercise they're too overweight they're not good enough those kind of things but without the practice and the improvement that's not going to change is it so again we've we've got to get over that initial hump to actually make that difference so let's get out there and do something to just try and improve that a little bit. And of course, start off small because even any increase on activity is going to start benefiting us and start making that change, which I think is really important and can make it a lot easier taking one little step rather than telling people to kind of come and play a game of football. Um, it's, you know, just come and, and have a little play with some activities on a court or come and do have a social group where we get a bit active at the end and do five minutes of seated exercise just anything to start that movement going interestingly um we've recently started talking to a group of ladies who have had some issues with uh, mesh implants so this is something that's been in the news there's been lots of court cases and things like that locally and one thing that we always do is we talk to our customers a lot about what they want out of something before we'll start a session so it's looking at you know what what their background is what their starting point is and what they're trying to achieve so our ladies were telling us that they're not very active anymore some of them have never been active but it's this fear of being active now because of all these side effects of their condition so again it's another issue where not necessarily aging but some very similar symptoms are causing them concern over what they can and can't do and what we found is that actually, um, as lots of people have been suggesting in the chat group, the way that worked for them was to start a social group. So what we've done is we've offered them a social group where they come along and they have about an hour and a half of drinking tea and chatting and discussing their week and, and uh, sharing tips about their symptoms and things like this. And then at the end of the session, we just do 15 minutes of exercise and activity. And over time, what that will allow us to do is then step it up or change it as it progresses, as they get maybe more confident or they want more out of it, we can address that and adapt it up. So it gives us that constant ability to change it and meet their needs. And that way, you know, if you look back 12 months down the line, you've done that much more than you had at the start, but without really realising it. It's kind of like sneaking vegetables into um, dinners for kids, the way I see sneaking exercise into stuff for people. So you know, that's, that's pretty much my experience. So I hope you don't mind me sharing that all with you. Thank you so much, Loretta. It's really great to hear from, you know, the different perspectives um, between you and Deb and, and also, you know, that um, from a perspective of a deliverer um, and what you're starting to do to support women in that area. And again, we've kind of Deb from the occupational therapist point of view, you're both from those positions as well. So really, thank you so much. Um, you know, data insight is one thing, but voices, um, you know, and listening to individual perspective um, it is, you know, is a, even more powerful. So um, conscious of time, we are going to jump straight into our group discussions and we've got 15 minutes. Um, so uh, Ed's got them already. 
already um, and we'll go into them. Um, if you can introduce yourself um, and then there's no facilitated questions. It's just an opportunity for you to kind of network, talk um, and reflect on what you've heard. Um, and then we'll come back in and I will wrap up. Hello. So I think we are all back. We had some fantastic discussions in our group, so I hope that the same um, from across the board. Um, I was going to whiz round and get one key thing from each group, but I, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, but I did um, stealthily put someone in each group who hopefully will be able to feed back maybe one or two things. Um, so I can add that in our in our follow up um, to everyone. So I hope you've enjoyed today's network. Um, Carrie, if you would be able to share the slides again, that would be great. Um, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, I think, like I said, we, we will try and follow up um, with any questions that weren't answered. So I think there were some really great questions that, that still came through. Um, and the next uh, This Girl Can Sussex Network forums, I was just mentioning in our group, hopefully we're going to address more of the kind of key things um, that are being raised by partners in terms of understanding and the things we need to think about um, in terms of engaging women and girls. So um, we will send Save the Dates out um, through the network. So if you aren't signed up as a This Girl Can Sussex promoter already, please do so. Um, I will send the link out again in the follow up um, email. And also, if you run sessions, if you want to talk about this after the event, if you've got some kind of um, bits and bobs you want to share, please do share them on social media and don't forget to tag us in. So use This Girl Can Sussex and also Active Sussex and we can we can share. Um, and we also just wanted to let you know, um, May is National Walking Month. Um, and also this week is Mental Health Awareness Week. The theme this year is nature. Um, so we're trying to revigorate our Healthy Selfie Sussex campaign, if any of you were, were part of that um, in the last lockdowns. Um, and this, again, is to really try and encourage as many people as possible to, to get outdoors and moving for their mental health as well as their physical health. And I think some of the conversations that we've had today and talking about just helping women move more in this stage of their life, hopefully this is something you can share and talk about in the context of menopause as well. Um, and finally, um, as Liz um, mentioned and we mentioned earlier, they will be launching their new research on menopause and midlife on the 19th of May. So the email that you received with the joining instructions for today had a link at the bottom if you want to sign up for that event. Um, Liz thinks that they might then obviously have that, that video um, available afterwards um, and we will continue to share anything that Women in Sport provide um, through the network. Um, and then finally, um, Joe is actually running a masterclass on the 9th of June. Um, your menopause starts before your period stop. So if you or anyone you know you think would benefit from that, um, then take a look at her website. So next slide, please, Carrie. So all that leaves me to say is a massive thank you. Um, and like I said, if there are any other questions, please drop them in the in the chat box um, and we will try to respond them. So thank you to Joe. Thank you so much. Because um, I know the, this last week's not been <laughs> not been a brilliant one for you. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Liz, again, thanks for joining once again. Um, I'm looking forward to the 19th. Thanks to uh, Deb and Loretta for sharing your stories. It, it really does help bring um, the insight to life and gives us a real understanding. Um, and thanks to the team, to Nick, Carrie um, and Sadie who have supported the event today. And also the other champions that I had stealthily in those, uh, those breakout groups. Oh, and if you did the questions, the quiz questions, there's the answers <laughs> at the bottom. So, Thank you once again, and um, we'll hopefully see you soon. Bye. Thanks, Gemma. Thank you. Thanks, Gemma. Thank you.